Hello, welcome to our first lesson on force of motion. Okay, all about Newton's laws and applying them to problems. Okay, so best place to start, probably Newton's first law. Okay, um, 10 points if you know it, but Newton's first law says that every object remains in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless forces act on it to change that state. So if something is, is moving, it will continue to move at a constant velocity, or if something is stopped, it will say stopped. Okay, I mean, another word for that is equilibrium. So things will stay in equilibrium unless they're act on by a force. Okay, seems obvious, but at the time that was quite groundbreaking. And Newton's second law then, is that change of motion is proportional to the applied force and in the same direction. So, I mean, if you push something harder, it will accelerate more. That's basically what he was saying. Okay, so F is proportional to A, and then he sort of went on to say that when you're working in SI units, that mass is the constant in that proportional relationship. Okay, and he came up with F equals MA, which is Newton's second law, in an equation that we can apply to problems. Okay. So you need this in your notes at F equals MA, and you should have done a bit of this at GCSE, so it's not going to be brand new to you. And it has to be an SI unit, so be careful, because sometimes they muck around with the units to catch you out. So that's where the force is in newtons, the mass is in kilograms, and the acceleration is in meters per second squared. So ms to the power minus 2, the neatest way of writing that. Okay, so F equals MA. Um, and one newton then is the force needed to give a one kilogram mass an acceleration of one meter per second squared okay or it's the force of one apple under gravitational acceleration roughly okay hence the story of newton under the apple tree okay so one newton is the weight of an apple roughly so a mass of 100 grams times by an acceleration of 9.8 Okay, um, then moving on then, so don't necessarily need to write this down, but it's definitely worth thinking about the difference between weight and mass. So if you want to have a pause the video and see if you can sort this out in your head before I tell you. The difference between weight and mass, I mean, mass is what you're made of, okay? It's the amount of stuff that's inside you, okay? Now that that won't change on a sort of a minute by minute, day by day basis. Obviously you can gain mass if you put on weight, you can lose mass if you lose weight. But for a fixed object, its mass never changes. But that's not true of something's weight, because weight depends on where you are, okay? Weight is a force, okay? Weight and mass are two different things. You, you don't have weight unless you've got an acceleration, and the acceleration for us on Earth is gravity. Then, obviously, you'll know that when you go to the moon, because the gravity is less, your weight is less. It's not that you've got less mass, you're still the same person. Okay, it's about one-sixth gravity on the moon, so your weight is about one-sixth. Okay, where people get confused is that on a weighing scales it says kilograms, but really weight is a force and it should be measured in newtons. And what's happening there is the weighing scales is either mechanically or digitally dividing your weight to tell you your mass. Okay, for Earth it's, it's designed to be used under gravity acceleration of 9.8. If you move the weighing scales to the moon, of course they're going to give you a wrong reading, they're not programmed for that amount of gravity. Okay. Now, the problem is, obviously, most people have never been in any different gravity, and so they get confused with weight and mass, okay, because your mass doesn't change, and neither does your weight, really. But if you've been into space, you'd know that you can be weightless if there's no gravity acting, okay? But weight is a force measured in newtons, and it's your mass times your acceleration, and your acceleration is gravity. So you'll see later on in mechanics that we quite often when we have the weight of something, call it mg, mass times gravity. Okay. Right, moving on. Right, now this you will need to put into your notes. There are three types of force that we generally deal with. There are others, but you don't need to know about those yet. 
We can push something where the force um, is from behind. You can pull something with a rope, okay? Or what you've got driving force, which comes from some sort of engine, or if a person was running, they would have driving force where the object generates the force itself to move, okay? And a car's a funny one because obviously the wheels turn the other direction, but you still go forward. So it's quite complicated what goes on there. It's all about equal and opposite forces between the wheel and the road. Okay, the tyre and the road. So pushing forces, pulling forces, tension and driving force. Uh, how they how they work doesn't mean how how do they go into the equation doesn't really change. It's how you draw them that really matters. Okay. And if you're drawing forces in mechanics, there's a little tip for you. Try and keep your force arrows to scale. So if I've got a 50 Newton force and a 100 Newton force, I would draw the 100 Newton force twice as big. Um, only because it helps your sort of your intuition to work out what's going to happen in a problem. If you can see different sized force arrows, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what is going to happen in a given situation. Okay, so try and keep some sort of scale. Don't just draw them all random lengths where big forces have got tiny arrows and little forces have got massive arrows. That's going to get confusing when you start doing problems with lots of forces. Okay. Right, so some questions for applying F equals MA. Feel free to pause the video and have a go at these. So jot them down in your notes, have a go at them, press play when you're ready. Okay, these are very, very simple, these ones, applying F equals MA. Okay, so F equals MA. In this question, we've got the mass and we've got the acceleration and we're trying to calculate the force. So F equals, and we're in SI units, the mass is 50, the force is 3, uh, sorry, the acceleration is 3, so the force pushing must have been 150 newtons. Okay, we're neglecting any uh, friction or resistance there. Okay, it's a smooth surface, otherwise, it gets a bit more complicated when you've got forces acting uh, opposite to what you want to do. Okay, the next one we've got the force this time, and we've got the acceleration, and what we're missing is the mass. So 300 equals 0.25m. Uh, if you do 300 then divided by 0.25, you'll get that 1,200 equals m. So the mass of the car is 1,200 kilograms. Remember, we're in SI units. So any answer you get is kilograms. And then number three. A truck of mass three tons, which is going to need a conversion because three tons, metric tons, is 3,000 kilograms. We've got a force of 0.6 kilonewtons. A kilonewton is a thousand, so 0.6 kilonewtons would be 600 newtons. So just a bit of a conversion into SI then. So 600 equals. 3000A, because we're finding the acceleration, so 3000A, and then if you do 600 divided by 3000, you should get that A is 0.2 metres per second squared. So they're really straightforward, okay? There's only three variables and two of them, you'll probably be told, okay? When it does get a bit more complicated is when we have to sort of merge this topic in with SUVAP, which we've just done. Okay, and I've got an example like that. It's quite a difficult one, but it does cover a lot of the skills you'll need to use to answer questions on this, where they've mixed uh, F equals MA with SUVAT. Okay, so here's my question. Uh, probably best you pause the video, write it all down, possibly have a go, see, see how you get on before I do it. Okay, and then watch me do it. Right, we've got a train of mass 20 tons. So M is 20,000. Okay, traveling through a station Amsville with a velocity of 10 meters per second on its way to Bridgeford, which is seven kilometers away. The engines provide a driving force of five kilonewtons. So initially F is 5,000 newtons. And they do that for one minute, okay, to increase the velocity of the train. Then it travels at a constant velocity for three minutes before breaking and coming to a halt at Bridgeford. So draw a velocity time graph of the journey between Amsterdam and Bridgeford. OK, 
Okay, so let's sketch it first of all. So we know the train had a velocity of 10 to start with and it accelerated for one minute. Then it traveled at constant velocity for three minutes and then it decelerated to a stop. Okay, so this was the first station it passed through. So A, this is when it stopped at B. This is velocity in meters per second, ms minus one. And this is the time in seconds. So I know it accelerated there for 60 seconds. Then it had a constant velocity for three minutes. So that's 180 seconds. So that's 240. I don't know. I don't know that value yet. Okay. And we're going to have to do some calculations okay, to fill this in. And we do know the total area is 7,000 because it says that the distance between the stations is 7 kilometers. So the total area under the graph is 7,000 meters. Right, let's label the parts of the journey. Okay, so you did a bit of this on Suva. And then what do we know about section 1? Okay. So in SUVAT terms, we know that U is 10. We know that T is 60. And that's about all we know. Okay. But we do know the train was accelerating. And it's a 20,000 kilogram train. And the force that it was uh, applying to accelerate was 5,000 newtons. So if we apply F equals MA. So I'll do it up here. So 5,000 equals 20,000 A, and do 5,000 divided by 20,000, you'll get that A is 0.25. So for a train of this mass, with a force of 5 kilonewtons, it accelerates at 0.25 meters per second squared. And now we've got three parts of SUVAT, and now we can do some more calculations. So let's work out V and let's work out S. So V is U plus AT. So that's 10 plus 0.25 times 60. Well, a quarter of 60 is 15. So V is 25. And then S is a half U plus VT. So that's a half of 10 plus 25 times 60, that's 1,050 metres. So we know everything there is to know about the first stage of this journey, look. We got to, let's move that out of the way. We get to a maximum velocity of 25 in 60 seconds, and we travelled 1,050 metres in the process. Okay, section two now then. Now, section two is constant velocity, so this should be straightforward. We know the velocity is 25 because we just worked it out. We know the time is three minutes, so 180 seconds. Distance is speed times time. So S for the middle section, 25 times 180 is 4,500 meters. So we've got 4,500 meters in there. Okay. And then section three let's have a look at what we already know so go back to blue so this time u because it's the initial velocity u is 25 v is zero because the train is going to come to a stop uh, i don't know t i don't know a i do know s okay and this is where you've got to remember that we know the total distance between the stations is 7,000 metres. Because, as you can see from our graph, we've already travelled 5,550 metres. So we haven't got far left to go. If you take that away from 7 kilometres, we've got 1,450 metres left of track. So 1,450 metres goes in there. Okay. Right, now we can calculate A, calculate T as well, if you need to. So to get A, we're going to have to use F equals MA again. Okay. No, 
sorry, we'll find A, and then we'll use F equals MA to find F. So, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Okay, put in what we know. So we know V is 0, so that's going to help. So 25 squared plus, now I can't do anything with A, but I can do 2S, so 2,900 A. Now 25 squared is 625. If I bring it over, I get minus 625, which is important because if A doesn't come out negative, we're not going to slow down. And if you do minus 625 divided by 2,900 to three significant figures, the acceleration is minus 0.216. Okay, and it does need to be minus because we are decelerating. Okay, and then if we use V equals U plus AT, we can find the time as well. So 0 equals 25 minus 0.216t. If you bring the 0.216t over to the left hand side and then to make it positive and then divide, you get that t to three significant figures is just about 116 seconds to stop the train. Okay, and then we can finish our graph 240 plus 116 is 356 seconds so very nearly six minutes for the whole journey okay and we've got one thing left to do because our graph is complete we've, we know everything there is to know about the graph calculate the braking force needed to stop the train so to work out f we need m and a so we've known m the whole time 20,000 we know that a is minus 0.216 and i'm going to keep it minus because I want it to decelerate, it's a braking force, it's a negative. Compared to the velocity, it's taking velocity away. Okay, so make sure that uh, deceleration and forces causing deceleration are always negative in your workings. Uh, 20,000 times 0.216 comes out as minus 4,320 newtons. Okay, so that's the braking force. And if you're designing a train, you would need to make sure that the brakes can produce that kind of force otherwise the trains are going to take too long to stop and they'll have to start braking earlier or if they don't brake early enough they're going to go through the station because they haven't decelerated quickly enough and they're going to go too far and overshoot the station okay so that's what we're doing next f equals ma is simple enough but when you've got to combine it with suvat as well sometimes you get a bit lost with how many numbers you've got okay you need three things in SUVAT, okay, to work out the other two. Not Having two is not enough. So if you've only got two things, you're probably going to need to use F equals MA to find the acceleration, okay? And if you've got the acceleration, then you can find the force. So it's just whether, which way you work forwards or backwards, depending on whether you've got the acceleration or not. Okay, so have a go at the questions I've attached. Let me know if there's any problems.